I thought I'd just introduce by saying a little bit about, about myself and how I got to be doing this very exciting work. Um, for some reason or another, I, um, I used to be very good at economics. And so <laughs> um, I um, was kind of got channeled in to studying economics and being an economist, and I ended up teaching economics. Uh, at Sussex University, and over the years, I noticed that um, everybody was just in their heads all the time, and they were completely disassociated with their bodies, and the, you know that kind of bumbling, kind of academic uh, archetype. And I noticed that I'd also become one myself, and so I started. And I was thinking, actually, we're going to need more than just intellect and thinking to address these, these issues, uh, these huge issues that we're living through today. So, uh, so, to, to, so to kind of like, that was my first conscious trying to rebalance my own life. And I started doing yoga and uh, meditation. And all of this uh, led me to, as soon as I started doing yoga and meditation, then I started studying shiatsu, and then I just got completely engrossed with the whole holistic worldview that these, these uh, practices um, were coming from. And it was like, it was sort of like, I don't know if you've ever had this experience of... Uh, knowing things in the inside, but not having a way of explaining it, not having a, a language. All of a sudden, I, I was given this, this beautiful language. This originally was a, the language of shiatsu and Chinese medicine. Um, so I, um, I, was, I, was, I was completely taken with it. And I, and I think a large re reason why it just completely went inside it didn't go through the intellect, it went inside. It was like a sort of a nourishment of the heart, this, this, this new philosophy and, and practice. Um, and I think it was because it was almost written in the language of poetry, some of this Chinese medicine. So when you, when you looked at the kind of, uh, the, 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 the way they describe acupuncture points and, and, the, and, the, and the, the functions, it was like poetry. And so it didn't have to go through the rational analytical brain and the judgment is this good bad do I know? you know so um, anyway this this whole kind of journey uh, led me to sort of leave economics and academia and study Chinese medicine for some time and um, and then I uh, had this realization that actually Chinese medicine is not just about healing ourselves as individuals it's about a whole philosophy of life and a whole holistic system of ecology, of li us being little ecologies embedded within bigger ecologies, and that the health, the health of the, s the individual was part of the health of the whole system. And I began to think, well, maybe we could use some of these principles from Chinese medicine to look at dynamics and health within organisations and systems. And that's what led me to Schumacher College, where I uh, was working in the science program to look at can we can we use principles from this holistic stance, understanding of health and link it into current understanding of contemporary science and ecology. Anyway, in my in my um, I'm sorry, this is a rather large introduction, but it it's relevant because my going to Bhutan was kind of a bit of the, a remembering of that deep wisdom that I had been introduced to some time before in terms of the Chinese medicine. Anyway, um, so I was hugely uh, uh, privileged and lucky to, to go to Bhutan to join their program in uh, <laughs> gross national happiness facilitation training. Um, so I'm not sure if that means that I'm a gross national happiness facilitator, but I want to share that that journey with you and, and what happened in Bhutan and what the understanding of gross national happiness is as a framework and also some of the shortcomings, I think, of, of, of that framework and also uh, some of the 
insights that I felt some of the Bhutanese participants gave about what gross national happiness actually meant to them in daily life. Um, and then I was hoping that at the end we could also have just a little, a little bit of uh, sort of a group discussion uh, in small groups about bringing gross national happiness back home and what that might mean for us. So this, um, this uh, I took this photograph of this in, in uh, a arts and crafts uh, college and I just thought, oh, can you imagine an art college in, in England having something like this up, saying it's, it, everywhere you go in Bhutan there are these kind of messages uh, uh, really coming from Buddhist philosophy. And here, what really struck me about this was that um, this acquisition of skills and knowledge is not for personal gain or development. It's always in service of the health of the whole, of the greater whole. Um, and it just struck me how important that message is. So the facilitator's training um, was organised by... This, this is our journey. It was organised according to Theory U. Have, have people... Who's come across Theory U? Quite a few people. So it was... Uh, um, our facilitators were Torvin Ha and Julia Kim, who have, have trained in this. And basically, the journey was looking at um, how can we... First of all, at the beginning of the journey was looking at, in the first two days, looking at what human development means, um, why our current measures of human development, particularly in terms of economic growth, aren't working, what's wrong with it, what are the alternatives, and can gross national happiness provide us with an alternative? So sort of scoping out the framework, really, uh, looking at what, what was out there. So we, we spent quite a lot of time learning about gross national happiness as a framework and how you measure it and how they use it in Bhutan. Then we dive deep into the, into the U part of uh, the learning journey, which was a time for kind of deep inner reflection, really. So what... What, are my, what does my inner landscape look like? What are my values and purpose? And, and we use various ways in, into that deeper ex exploration. So we, we, the, the main part of it was various meditation practices and this, this long pilgrimage up to one of the, the most sacred sites in Bhutan, which we did in silence, and we, we set ourselves various intentions along the way. And then um, we then continued our journey looking at ins inspirational projects in Bhutan that could, could be what the manifestation of gross national happiness looks like in, in practice in Bhutan. And then we began to explore seeds of, um, well, if I was going to put this into practice in my own life, what might it look like? And beginning to sort of prototype some, some ideas. So that it was very much... The, the, the facilitators training was very much uh, in the U theory. So just to look to explore that in a bit, bit more detail. So what is, first of all, exploring the landscape, what, what is gross national happiness? And this is the definition uh, provided by the uh, Prime Minister Thinley, who actually, he, he's no longer the Prime Minister. He, 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 uh, uh, he, he gave up his reign, if you like, in July this year. But I think it's a very interesting definition of happiness. So, saying we've clearly distinguished the happiness in gross national happiness from fleeting, pleasurable, feel-good moods. Um, and we know that true abiding happiness cannot exist while others suffer and comes only from serving others, living in harmony with nature, and realising our innate wisdom and the true and brilliant nature of our own minds. So this is, so when people talk about happiness as, a, as, a, as an objective, it's quite often in our culture associated with kind of pleasure and hedonism. But actually, this definition of happiness is, is although it ultimately is a source of 
joy and contentment and, and peace and being more alive, um, it's actually focused on, on service. It's, it's looking at, the, it's looking at um, coming into alignment with your own purpose, if you like. So it's aligning self with self with your higher purpose. It's, align, it's reconnecting with nature and it's reconnecting uh, with others. So this, this language underlying this, this definition of happiness is very much, um, we, we see it quite a lot coming, coming out in a lot of literature in the West these days. So there's um, Satish's latest book, Soil, Soul and Society, is all about reconnecting with nature, reconnecting with ourselves to our soul and reconnecting with society. And Otto Sharma as well in his, his latest work, leading from the emerging future, is talking about our, the multiple disconnects in our society and the route to health and wholeness and ultimately happiness is through healing those disconnects. And he talks about various disconnects. He talks about the spiritual cultural divide, the social divide and the, and the ecological divide. So interestingly, this this language is becoming almost quite mainstream. Um, but this, in this definition that uh, the Prime Minister gave, I think, is really rooted in that type of thinking. OK, so gross national happiness kind of hit the headlines in the 1970s. Um, and I think it was a kind of almost like a knee-jerk reaction when the king of Bhutan, which is a tiny country, I think it's got 740,000 people, so less than a million, was in um, a intergovernmental forum and he was challenged, well, you know, who's Bhutan to make a comment? I mean, what's your gross national product? And he said, well, actually, we're not interested in gross national product, product. we're interested in gross national happiness. And he was kind of laughed out of the door at that time. Um, but actually, this, 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 um, focusing of the Bhutanese economy and society around human well-being goes back much longer. And I discovered that in 1729, there's a legal code, this is fantastic, I love this quote, declared that if the government cannot create happiness for its people, uh, there is no purpose for the government to exist. <laughs> so I think that's a great challenge. Um, so anyway, it was coined in the 1970s. And it's been actually a development policy of Bhutan for the last 40 years or so, but in the last decade has really kind of hit the headlines. And they've been overwhelmed with international visitors, businesses, governments coming to Bhutan to find out what's different and what, what does gross national happiness actually look like in practice. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to, in the words of the uh, recent uh, Prime Minister, just he's just going to explore what what or gross national happiness is the philosophy that had guided Bhutan's uh, development process for about now 40 years. It is based on the belief that development must serve a purpose. That development's role is not simply to promote continuous and limitless economic growth which is what GDP or the conventional economic models tend to do. And that again, in, within a finite environment, within a finite world, there are bounds within which growth can take place. Natural, social, resources and so forth. And so G&H is based on the belief that uh, development must be human-centered and that its objective must be to create those conditions that will enable the human individual to achieve what is most important to him. And that happens to be happiness. And then again, happiness we believe is a condition that can be attained when one is able to balance the needs of the body 
with those of the mind, the physical and the mental needs being balanced. And likewise, the uh, balance between the spiritual needs of the human individual and the material needs. And so it is a human-centered, holistic, sustainable and uh, inclusive development approach. Now more and more people who are dissatisfied with the result of pursuing an economic development uh, that is no longer seen to be sustainable, they are seeing g &H as an alternative development paradigm. So that's from the words of the ex-Prime Minister himself and I think it's interesting that the focus is very much on this kind of dynamic balance between mind and body, between material and spiritual needs. So I'm sort of going through the sort of the journey that we went through in Bhutan. Uh, so as I say, in the first few days we were learning about gross national happiness, and I'll come back to that in a bit more detail to look at some of those indicators. But the third day um, was what they called inner transformation of social change, which was basically a, a day of silence and meditation uh, where we walked uh, up this absolutely <laughs> vertical mountain to this tiny little monastery which is perched right on the edge. And it's, it, it's reputed to um, stay, uh, it's reputed to be tied onto that mountain by, by angel hair. And it, and it really felt like it. And, and for me, actually, it was, it was I'm, I'm terrified of heights. So I just had this really big thing about confronting my fear uh, w walking up this, this mountain. Um, but we all set ourselves this, a, pers a personal intention for the day um, about, really about what, what, what can I bring? Or what, are, what are my own motivations? What are my own values? What's my own purpose? How can I bring this into the external, into the external world uh, as part of the social transformation that's uh, needed at this time? And not just thinking about the all the new things uh, that I can evolve and develop, but also recognising there's a lot to, a lot of uh, letting go that needs to happen. Um, and so sort of identifying some of those things, things that we need to let go of before the new can emerge. Um, anyway, the story of Tiger's Nest, I mean, it's reputedly the most sacred site in Bhutan. And I felt so, well, you know, just blown away really to be going there. And um, it's where um, Guru Patmasambhava reputedly f flew on a tiger. And there's all these amazing stories and myths in Bhutan. I mean, it's such a magical place. And he meditated there for three years and three months and three days and three hours um, to liberate people from, from uh, e the evil that... Uh, um, was in that area at the time repeatedly, so um, so this is this is where Buddhism first came to to Bhutan. Um, anyway, the, the 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 so that was our kind of deep dive, if you like, and then we um, moving up the curve. We were looking at some inspirational projects. Well, what does it look like in practice? And basically, we visited four different types of projects. We we uh, visited. Uh, a social environmental enterprise project, we <coughs> visited a health project, we visited uh, an education project and a governance project. And this one is, um, um, this, this, there's so many people called Karma in uh, Bhutan. He, he won uh, Prince Charles Youth International Award for his new uh, recycling business, an incredibly inspiring uh, guy. Um, and we also went to this Centre for Media and Democracy, um, 
It's just so inspiring. Uh, Bhutan has only recently become a democracy. Um, and there's this youth group where they're using uh, Parker J. Palmer's Healing the Heart of Democracy as a guide to I introduce democracy in, into Bhutan. And they're all talking, and there's, they're, they're cultivating in this youth group five habits. And the five habits are interconnectedness, that we're all in this together, diversity and appreciation of difference, how to hold tensions in life, um, in, how to hold tension in life-giving ways, uh, practicing agency and voice and how our voice matters. Ooh. And what's the last thing? And. Yeah, and, and, and creating community. Um, and they, they have these uh, forums, which, which they call circles of trust, where they're creating uh, trust amongst the groups and how they can create courage to really speak uh, what they believe in and speak from the heart. And it's just so kind of powerful and touching to see these, like, I don't know, 20, 21-year-olds doing this, this work. Um, then we... Um, we... Towards the end of the journey, we then began to say, well, what's coming out of this? And, and different people clustered together to, to look at some of the seeds that were coming out of this, this journey that we'd all been on. And... Um, I was involved with this group here around evolving a, uh, a program in, in right livelihood. Um, what would it mean if... Because um, I've, I've long been of the view that many of the participants at Schumacher College come to the college when they're in a, in a, in a period of, of change. And so they're thinking, actually, the way I'm living my life isn't working at the moment, but I'm not quite sure what I want to do, or do I just need another job? But, and, and then they do different courses, but this, this program in Right Livelihood would be really focused on uh, people exploring what, what it is that they really want to bring forth in the world and, and how they can be supported in doing that. So we explored in this little working group, what that Right, right Livelihood course programme might look like. Um, and, uh, okay, so that gives you a little bit of a story of what I was doing in Bhutan, but now I want to just talk, to you a little, talk with you a little bit about uh, what Gross National Happiness the Framework means, and then some of my own observations about um, are they measuring it in the right, are they going about this in the right way? Um, so gross national happiness is quite, it's, it's, I, I, I'm surprised how developed it is as a framework, um, largely for measuring how, pe how happy people are. So that, that, oh, year on year, they can see, the government can see uh, are they doing the right thing. Um, so they have these four pillars and then they have nine domains, and I'll just briefly explain what they are. But interestingly, the four pillars are based on uh, Buddhist principles. So they have... Um, the first principle is of uh, loving-kindness. And so they're saying, how can we create the conditions in our country for, pe for people to pursue happiness and well-being, for, that, for the health and well-being of all? Um, so what governance systems do we need in place? Um, the second one is of compassion. So how can we, you know, we have caused suffering to, to many beings on the planet, so how can we um, alleviate that suffering through, through, comp through compassion, which is their second principle of, of preservation of the environment. The third principle is of joy, and this is around how, how can we cultivate joy through healthy human relationships and, 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 and community. 
Um, so their third principle is preservation, preservation and promotion of culture. And interestingly, this, these pillars are all equal, of equal strength. So the culture is just as important as economic development or good governance. Um, so it's really very, very central to Bhutanese um, uh, ideology. And the th fourth one of inclusiveness, where they talk about that the sun shines on all equally. It shines on good and evil, and it shines on us all in, in the same way. So it's practicing the principle of equanimity, um, inclus inclusiveness and equity. So these are the four pillars, and they then have this horrendous nine domains, and then 33 indicators, and 124 questions, which I think where it, it might be where it kind of gets a bit kind of migraine inducing. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, except to say that the Gross National Happiness Index, um, I'll just read them out uh, just to make sure everyone can see it. So they have the nine domains of psychological well-being, health, time use, education, cultural diversity and resilience, good governance, community vitality, ecological diversity and resilience, and living standards. So in, in um, uh, the mainstream way of measuring human development, we would just be looking at one indicator within living standards, which would be gross national product, growth in gross national product. So this obviously creates a huge diversity of other ways of, of looking at... Um, human well-being and it is quite different to some of the other alternatives that are out there so there's the happy planet index or the human development index so happy planet index will look at um, uh, health and ecological footprint and uh, perceptions of well-being and the human development index looks at health and education and living standards, but none of them look at this whole range, and particularly the particularly innovative ones are the introduction of psychological well-being, uh, time use, and this whole importance of community and community resilience and cultural diversity. So they are actually introducing some quite new concepts and whole uh, measurement process, if you like, of, of, of well-being. Yeah. Well, they do. Work isn't just paid work. It it's includes voluntary <coughs> work as well. Um, so, they don't, so in their work thing, they don't include just paid work. What about concepts like learning or leisure? Well, that would be um, in... Well, the learning would be in education, but it is quite different from the Max Neef one, where we have um, idleness in there as a, and when, whenever I've looked at the Max Neef, I don't know if people have come across it, uh, it's another framework to look at uh, human well-being and human health and needs. Whenever I've done it with a, a, with a group in, uh, of, of Western people, the time use one is always the one which people are most short of. So they can feel quite satisfied in the others, but they always feel under pressure for time. Um, so it, it, in Bhutan, at least they've, uh, they've, they've got it in there. And actually, I mean, I was just flicking through. I mean, there's a, so many of these indicators to, to, to get a bit of better sense of what's underlying some of these. So it is a bit more sophisticated than just work and sleep when you get into the detail. Um, I won't go... Well, I just... I did want to share with you a, a little bit of what's underlying some of them. Uh, so the psychological well-being, I mean, it is, it's quite extraordinary what they ask people. They, they do go out and where well, they're looking at emotional balance and they, they will ask people to what extent they've experienced different emotions in the, in the past month. Um, and, they, and they have a range of emotions which people can choose from, from, from anger and fear to calmness to jealousy. 
<laughs> and, um, and then in terms of cultural diversity and resilience, they're really keen on, uh, well, really critical to their sense of well-being is this importance of making and artisan skills. And within Bhutan, there's 13 crafts, uh, which everyone uh, knows and will be expert in one or two, two or maybe three of them. And the, the, the whole arts and crafts schools there are um, really core to this whole sense of gross national happiness. And, and everybody trains in a craft and skill. Um, this <laughs> time use, they have this kind of thing that we must have eight hours sleep to be healthy. <laughs> you know, it's really, um, uh, and so people that are, you know aren't having eight hours sleep, they don't meet that uh, the, the target, if you like. So it's it's really it's quite extraordinary. Look at digging deep in, into some of these uh, what some of these indicators are actually measuring. Um, so are people in Bhutan happy? Well, um, it's yeah. I mean, it's th there's. The, the overall result of the last survey, that 41% of people in Bhutan have achieved the happiness threshold, um, which isn't, uh, isn't kind of overwhelming result. Um, but what you do see, um, it's interesting to see where people uh, feel that they're not, uh, where, where they feel undernourished. Um, so the, there's uh, people lack sufficiency in knowledge and participation in festivals and how much they donate to the community is also <laughs> measured. Um, but we also so see... How, how do they define, sorry, how yeah. do they define sufficiency? What, oh, well, they have a... They, they, they do... I mean, it's quite me me mechanistic, this whole thing. So they have a cut-off point, which they have defined in each of these areas. So like in artisan skills, I think sufficiency is to have a skill in, in at least two out of the 13. So they, I mean, it's, and I guess pretty arbitrary as well. Um, so there are these thresholds. Sorry, do you mind having a question? No, go, yeah, go for it. How, well, how are they determined? How, who, who says this is a sufficiency or, or this isn't? Where do they come from? Um, I, to be quite honest, not quite sure how the whole thing was developed. Um, it, it is, uh, this is one of the things I'm going to get back to. I mean, it is actually quite mechanistic, the whole thing. I mean, it is extraordinary what they are measuring, um, but they're doing it in a kind of very mechanistic way. It was, was my, one of my observations. Yeah, yeah. Judy, the concept of donations, I mean, that's what they mean? charitable. Uh, that's donations to the community, oh, okay. in in money and time. Okay. So in this case, they said they lack sufficiency in donations, meaning that they don't feel that they donate enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, interestingly, the um, we've got this this classic, and it, it, we see this in, in international and and cross-sectoral and data where you, you see that the happiness, you, you've basically got a curve here which is flattening out. Um, so up to a certain point, more income does increase happiness and then it flattens out. Um, so you, you see that very clearly in this data. And then you also see um, how household happiness and household income um, it, there's quite a uh, equality between regions in gross national happiness, but a certain amount of inequality in the, in the per capita income. But that doesn't ha that hasn't really affected very much the level of GNH. And Timpu is the capital where you've got the highest uh, per capita income. So. I hope that gives you a sense of how this thing is constructed and it is a bit of a kind of grinding through all of these measurements and coming out with these thresholds and then saying how, 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 how happy people are. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is that it isn't just a set of indicators. It's, it's the whole country's development strategy and they do use this as a way of allocating resources between different groups and, and as a way of designing policies. 
So it's very integral to the whole uh, uh, development strategy of Bhutan. And what I think is really interesting is how they, how they screen policies through this tool. And when Cho was here from Bhutan a, a, a few months ago, he told this fantastic story of how they were thinking of joining the World Trade Organization and opening up to free trade. And all the finance ministers and the trade ministers saying this is great and you know we'll all benefit from this. So that, and, and he managed to convince people, that, well, this sounds like a good idea. And then they put, put it through, uh, joining the World Trade Organization, they put it through the Gross National Happiness Tool. And they decided, actually, it's not. And, they, and then they decided not to join the WTO. So they do use it as a, uh, very proactively as a policy screening tool, which I think is fantastic. Um, but I think what's also different about it is that it isn't just about measuring and calculating and, and policy analysis. It's also about a shifting consciousness because basically they've shifted the whole focus of development away from just material growth to, to inner growth in, in happiness and well-being and very much focusing on this balancing between mind and body and spiritual and, um, and material needs. Um, anyway, at the end of the week there, um, w uh, we all were kind of feeding back what our observations were. And this, this uh, woman from Bhutan, I think she really captured for me some kind of discomfort I'd been having about this whole framework. And she said, you've got to be really careful about measuring happiness in this way. And that all of this, having the framework and cutting it up and dissecting it, actually might be killing what is the nature, nature of happiness and well-being. And I used this example of how, you know, to, to try and understand life, in, in Western science, quite often we end up dissecting things. I, mean, I don't know if anybody's studied biology here, but it's all about cutting up things. To understand life, we look at death. And she was saying, you know, that's so the opposite of what we need to be doing. What we need to be doing is looking at how gross national happiness manifests in everyday life. And it's about, it's really about the, happiness is about the art of living. And she says, I want to tell you some stories about life in Bhutan for, for, and for which me, for me, manifests what I think gross national happiness is. She says, because looking at this framework and all of these indicators, I can't relate it back to my everyday life with my family. And so she, she told us some of the things which she felt was what happiness in Bhutan was all about. And um, the first thing is this, um, uh, this importance of art in Bhutan as, as a spiritual practice. And we, we went to um, an arts and crafts college there. And this is like the third year in painting class. And it just blows you away. The, the beauty of these paintings and the power of them. Um, but also, the practice is so completely different from how we might practice arts and crafts traditionally here, say in the West. So, and, and we actually did some Buddhist art, and it was like really regimented. It was like everything has to be measured exactly. And it was a real discipline. It was like a Zen discipline. You have to do it time and time again, and each year, you move from drawing these, you can move from drawing the Buddha head to drawing the whole Buddha in year two. And then over, by year five, you can kind of advance to, and it's very, very structured. So it's not, and it's, it's about, um, so to become a good artist, basically you, you meditate uh, and you become the deities of the Buddhas that you are, painting and so although they are inherited design so it's not me creating my version of the medicine buddha you inherit the design but it's in your 
meditation and your practice in the becoming of this Buddha that resonates in your painting and brings it to life. And it reminded me of um, other traditions that have this um, creative practice, or ha have a different practice around art and design. And, and uh, I learned a bit about Aboriginal painting, where again, you would inherit designs from your, from your forefathers. And um, maybe it was the crocodile dreaming. And so to, to be able to really paint the crocodileness, you had to become crocodile. And it, in, in the becoming of it, that painting would resonate with, with crocodile. And similarly with these, it's the same philosophy. And nobody owns these paintings, so you don't put, oh, Julie, you know, and, and become a famous artist. They're not, they're not uh, named, and you just become known because of the resonance of your work. So everybody draws, there's a thousand and one medicine Buddhas, and they're all doing the same thing, but the ones that really resonate are the ones that become famous and get work, but not because they sign it at the bottom. So very interesting, I thought, art is, art is a spiritual practice in, in Bhutan. Another thing uh, that she talked about was um, how nature is sacred in Bhutan and how it is alive. Um, and so the mountains and the rivers and the rocks have their deities and their spirits. Um, and this is taken really seriously. And uh, so to the extent that the sacred mountains, you're not, there's no um, mineral mining, you're not allowed to. Some of the highest mountain peaks in the world remain uncl unclimbed in Bhutan because you're not allowed to climb those mountain peaks because they're for the gods. So there's this really, and when you look at the, all, all the, uh, the indicators around connection with nature, they're all really, really strong, and people feel a, huge, a, a, a strong responsibility for protection of the environment. And it is pristine and has some of the highest levels of conservation. I think it's got about 70% of the land is under forest, and f over 50% of that is under conservation areas. So they have very high levels of of biodiversity. And, but it's not that it's not being threatened, and it is. Um, the other um, thing that she talked about was uh, uh, how they understand health. And um, <coughs> this really spoke to me, because I was talking earlier about my interest in Chinese medicine. And she was talking from the same place, really. And she was talking about how um, health is, um, is connected, is about becoming whole as a person. And the word health actually comes from the word holy and spiritual. Um, and and this, this, this almost final point where health um, is about a height, heightened state of awareness and o overcoming the ego. It's not about um, germs and diseases and coming inside us. It's about how we, and actually even being challenged by ill health is an opportunity for enlightenment and that's how they, they, they view it within the spiritual tradition. But the definition of dis-ease is about when you become disconnected, when you come, become disconnected from yourself and, and you don't know what you're feeling or you get stuck in certain habitual patterns of mental states, um, or when you become disconnected from others, disconnected from the ecosystem. And remember that the, that the health of the whole is seen as this little mini ecosystems within <coughs> bigger ecosystems. Um, so, and that health is as much an art as it is a science. It's about the art of living, living well. Um, and it reminded me of, um, there we are, the body with all its ailments is seen as the primary vehicle towards enlightenment. Totally different from the way we, we see health. And this is the medicine Buddha here. And it reminded me of this film that I saw years ago. It had a huge impact on me. It was about Tibetan medicine. And this doctor, I never know if this is true or <coughs> it's a myth, but this doctor escaped from Tibet and... Um, 
went to a German pharmaceutical company with all his medicinal remedies and herbs. And the German pharmaceutical company kind of started measuring it all and saying, well, how, can, how could that combination of herbs cure, I don't know what it was, blood pressure or something? Um, and so they, they started looking at the chemical composition of all of these herbs. And they said, there's no way that that herbal remedy could do what you're saying it does. And um, so in the end, they kind of, because he was insisting, yes, it's really good for this, this, and this. And in the end, they decided to look at not just looking at the chemical composition of these different herbs, but they began to look at the, 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 res, the, the light vibration of the herbs, and they began to shift their way of thinking about what the, the power of these medicinal remedies were, was more introducing a different type of energetic resonance to shift. It's a bit like a, a tuning fork, how you can sh shift the, the pattern of organisation through through the introduction of uh, a certain type of herb, and the and the more um, they were the more they were investigating it, it, they were saying actually these herbs capture certain sorts of movements. So if you if you eat a root, then it has a very downward movement, whereas if you eat spring shoots, it has a very upward movement. And when you introduce this information into the body, it can introduce those, those, those movements that are necessary. So if you have prolapses, you want upward lifting movements and so forth. So a very different way of looking at uh, health and well-being. Um, and, of course, we have to... Uh, the role of or the place of women in Bhutan um, it is, it is a matriarchal system and... And women do have the same rights as men and have owned over 50% of the property, which I think is, is really important. So, um, so the role, so the, 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 yeah, so I think that is um, something that struck me as distinctive about this place. And finally, um, oh no. Uh, well, yes, here. I thought, well, I don't want to make it sound too idealistic, because it, 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 it isn't, and it, um, and I, but I do think that this really captures kind of where Bhutan is at. I mean, it isn't living in the past. I mean, they do have the internet and iPads and the TV, and, um, and yet they live, they're in this very important time, I think, where uh, is, is the modern consumer culture going to take over, or are there very traditional and cultural va historical values and current and traditional values, are they going to be strong enough uh, to kind of moderate that, that trend? And, and I don't know, I think it's, we're really at a juxtaposition, I think it's a really important time, every time. Um, and... Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but um, they have these fantastic dances in Bhutan. Uh, again, they're all part of, uh, very much regarded as part of the spiritual practice and practicing compassion and equanimity and harmony and so forth. But in all of these uh, dances, they have this, um, this what looks like a devil. And he's really rude. I mean, he, he has a huge phallus. And he's just poking everyone with this thing and <laughs> sticking it in his mouth and licking it. And, and this goes on even in the highest spiritual um, uh, uh, dances. So I said, what the hell? <laughs> because it's really embarrassing. And he's also <laughs> making fun of the audience as well, I, of himself. And he said, oh, well, he's the teacher. And I'm like, well, what the hell does that mean? And... Uh, He's called Jopakuni. Oh, you know. Yeah, very much. Can you explain a little bit? Well, it's, it's the incarnation of crazy wisdom, yeah. well, which is a myth, by the way. I mean, um, yes. Oh, okay, thank but you. But it's, it's, a, it's the incarnation of all the crazy behavior that men, you know, liberated 
I know, I know. And I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking, well, what, if, you know, we call it, the, you know, we call it the, the joker or the devil, but actually he's the teacher. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It reminds me of the lingam that which is prevalent in India, as you know. Um, they worship uh, Phallus and they bless it with water and all sorts of other things right. <laughs> in a regular ceremony. And it seems to me very ancient, this, because it's, it represents uh, fertility, if biased towards the male fertility, I suppose. But they also have the Om, and the Om, uh, the, there's a thing called the Om Phallus, which you even find in France, which is the circle and the stone sticking in the middle. So there's both, there's yeah. the one. So the Om being the female circle and the Phallus. Yeah. Right. Very yes. Okay, so we're just coming to the end, really. I um. Just thinking about bringing bringing this this learning back home and and how personally how I've tried to do that. So um, what one of those ways is that is that we're now creating this joint program with the Centre for Growth National Happiness, which is a one year program learning program in, in right livelihood. Um, also, it just struck me that uh, there's. It's really important to tell the more indigenous ways of understanding health and well-being. Um, and so I'm working with um, uh, that Bhutanese participant in looking at how, how we might be able to uh, provide another narrative to the health and wellness based on the indigenous understanding of, of health and well-being. Um, and also here at the college, the work that we're doing in the economics for transition and the importance of, or the yeah, the integral importance of the the inner learning journey and the outer manifestation, um, I think is 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 very much inspired and continues to be inspired by um, visits such as this to Bhutan.